The title of today's sermon is called, Does God Need Us? Does God Need Us? And again, if you've you know, been at All Nations Community Fellowship for a while, you'll notice that for me, you know, Bible, everything in the Bible has to make sense. I would not be a Christian if I did not believe what the Bible made absolute sense. And I am standing here today because without a shadow of a doubt, in my, heart, in my heart and in my mind, everything in the Bible makes not only great sense, but it is so true, so true for everyone. And one of the questions that I would often ask myself, does God need us? If God is so almighty, if God is so powerful, why does God need us? Or why does God use us? We're going to address that issue on Luke chapter, chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. It's a little bit long, but let's read it all together. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. This is a passage where Jesus chose 12 disciples. And the first group of people that he chose were a bunch of fishermen, people that like, they like to go fishing. Okay. Let's all read it together, verse 1 through 11. Let's begin. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. We can do it a little louder. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all day last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as there were the others with him. His partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. You know, last week I preached to you about temptations that Jesus experienced after he was baptized by John the Baptist. While he was wandering around in the desert, he was tempted by the devil. And I told you that was part of the process of fulfilling God's plan for Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 5, after he was tempted, now this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But it's very curious that, you know, at the beginning of his ministry, the first thing that Jesus did was to select 12 disciples. Before he did every, anything else, before he started doing, you know, maybe, you know, forming a system, maybe, you know, coming up with plans, before he did anything else, one of the first things that he did was to select disciples. Now, when I first read this passage years ago, one of the first questions that came to my mind was, why? Why did God choose these groups of people? Because if you notice in this passage, the first group of people that Jesus chose were fishermen. Now, I'm not going to, you know, knock down the, the role of uh, people who, you know, who are fishermen. That is a very noble job and in fact back then they said it was somewhat prosperous you know it was a good paying job but over all the people that existed why fishermen fishermen are common laborers most of them many of them most of them were illiterate they were not scholars by any you know stretch of the imaginations in fact in those times there were many people that were very well educated Pharisees were known to be very educated, and they were in abundance. There were Greek philosophers all over the European, the continent. Why didn't he choose, maybe even perhaps, people in high position? Why not soldiers? People who are mighty, with authority. 
why not choose some of the you know high politician, you know, one of the wealthy people or some you know people in high positions, politicians with great power and authority. Why not these people? But instead, he decided to choose a bunch of fishermen, common folks, everyday workers. Why? The answer to that question is this. The reason why Jesus decided to choose these type of people to do his work was because Jesus wanted to be glorified. Because Jesus wanted to be glorified. Now that answer in itself is very odd and curious. Because when, when someone says, you know, I want you to glorify me, I want to be glorified, we have a negative connotation. But in fact, Jesus said that in everything that you do, you need to glorify me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, which Jesus, he was talking about himself. Now, some of us, we, when we hear that kind of talk, we say, man, that is a very selfish talk. Because whenever we hear, you know, statements like that, you know, I want to be glorified, the first image that, we, we, you know, that comes to our mind are celebrities and athletes. Because too often, we see people who are athletes, you know, they always, you know, talk about themselves, how great they are, you know, how many championship rings they have, and how much better than they are than other people. And everything they do, they, whenever they win something, they stand on the table and they, you know, you know just, you know, wait, you know, you know, pump their fists in the air and wave at the crowd and they, you know, you know, pump their chest saying, I'm the best, I'm number one. So when we hear the word, you know, when someone says, you need to glorify me, we automatically have this image of someone being very selfish and arrogant. But that's not the case when it comes to Jesus Christ. The motivation and the purpose is far from the people that we see on television. The reason why Jesus wanted to be glorified, the reason why he wanted God to be glorified, was so that people will know who Jesus really is. Think about it. For God to be glorified simply means that his name will be known. His character will be known. Who he is will be known. That's what it means to be glorified and to be lifted up. When God said, I want to be glorified, it's, it's simply God stating, you know what, I want the world to know who I am. I want the world to know what an amazing God I am. God has nothing to prove. Only thing that God desires is for everyone to know exactly what type of God he is. A loving God, a merciful God, an amazing God. The reason why he wanted to be glorified is because he wants everyone in the world to know what an amazing God he is so that they will accept him as their Lord and their Savior. So going back to the first question, so why did God choose these men as their disciples? Did God really need them? Why did God choose these common folks like fishermen, everyday workers. That's because God wanted to be glorified through him. Let me go back. I skipped over a part. But I want to share with you a story that I, uh, about a friend of mine. His name is Albert Yu. He's a, he's a pastor in America. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. One day I was in my office. And Albert, my friend, Pastor Albert, he called me up and he says, Paul, hey, let's get together for lunch. And without much thought or hesitation, I accepted because, you know, that's not anything unusual. A friend of mine calling me up and asking me to meet for lunch. So we met together at a restaurant and we started eating. And then all of a sudden, he started bringing up this product. He started bringing up this product and he was giving me a sales, sales pitch. And while he was doing that, I was somewhat shocked and amazed that in my mind, I was thinking, what are you doing? You are a pastor. Why are you trying to sell me this product? And the product that he was trying to sell me was this thing called Mangosteen. 
I don't know whether you've heard about it or not. I never heard about it until he told me about it. And he kept saying, you know, and he, he spent about the next hour and a half during lunchtime trying to sell me this product called Mangosteen. And what an amazing product it is that how somehow, just to kind of sum it up, I'm not going to sell you this product, so don't worry. He was saying that this is, has high level of an, antioxidant of some sorts. And he said that these product, this product was known to help people with sinus problems, with allergy problems, and skin disorder. He said, it just does amazing thing. And he kept trying to sell me on it for about an hour and a half. And, and toward the end, I'm like, you know, this, I can't believe. He just flipped out. You know, I can't believe a pastor is trying to sell me a product you know, to another pastor. But at the end, this is what he said. He says, Paul, I'm not here to try to make money off of you. I'm not even here to try to sell this product. I'm here because I believe in this product. And I want you to try it. And this is what he said. And this is the part that made me feel a little better at the end. He said, Paul, I'm not, you don't even have to pay. I'm going to buy you the first case. And you try it. I just want you to try it. That's all. Well, you know, if he was going to give me, buy the first case, I said, why not? So the first case arrived. But, you know, I'm not really into taking medicines. In, in fact, my wife always gets on me because I, I don't take vitamins. I, when I'm sick, I rarely take medicine. I think medicine is not good for you, you know, I, my personal opinion. Um, so I didn't try it. But then I knew that my wife's brother, I knew that he had sinus problems. And at times he had migraine. I said, you know, I gave it to him. I said, why don't you try it? And I told my wife to give it to him, thinking it might benefit him. And I completely forgot about it. And then about a month later, a month, a month and a half later, all of a sudden my wife comes up to me and says, my brother called me. And he said, he asked me, can we order more of these for him? I'm like, why? He said, well, because my brother, he had this sinus problem that he, he, he'd been taking medicines for years and years, paying expensive, you know, paying a lot of money for this and then he would, I don't know the problem but he said he'll always get drips and stuff and sinus problem nasal congestions but he said when he tried mangosteen it totally eliminated that problem without the side effects of the medicine and he was just blown away and he said he asked me to buy more of this mangosteen I got a feeling maybe some of you is going to google the mangosteen on the internet and maybe buy it today uh, if it works out for you, please give me some commission or at least buy me a lunch for uh, introducing you a nice product. And he did that. And then when he did that, he was amazed and he asked me to buy more of it. And then it was at that time I understood even more why my friend was encouraging me to, you know, talking so highly about mangosteen. It wasn't because he was trying to sell a product. It was because he believed in the product. And because he believed in the product, he wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted me to know how good of a product it was. So that eventually, and he, even, he, he was even willing to pay for it and spend his own money. Why? So that down the line, once I discover, discover the quality of mangosteen, that I will accept it, that I will buy it, that I will take it and put it into my life. He said, that's the way it was. That's the way, same principle with Jesus Christ. God wants to be glorified. Not because of he wants his name to be known for ego and his own pride. No. Because he wants everyone in the world to really discover what an amazing God Jesus Christ is. He wants everyone in the world to know what a you know, loving God he is, what a patient God is, what a merciful God he is. And once everyone truly discovers that and gets a taste of that, he knows that once a person gets a taste of the amazing God, that they will have no choice but to accept him into their lives as their Lord and Savior. That is why God wants to be glorified, so that we may accept Him as our Lord and as our Savior. But again, going back to the original question, why did God choose a bunch of people with little to offer to do His work? Why did He choose these common people, some illiterate people, to do His work of spreading the gospel? Clearly when Jesus had better options. But the reason why Jesus did this and chose us mankind was because we were so imperfect. The reason why God chose those fishermen, the reason why God chose the rest of the disciples, actually the Bible does not give the, the, the what do you call it, the occupation uh, of the remaining disciples. Except for Matthew, the tax collector, he was considered traitor uh, 
by many, by the Jewish people. There was Luke. Actually, he was pretty, had a pretty good job. He was a doctor. But the rest were fishermen. rest were unknown. So why did he you know, choose these people? The answer is because they were so imperfect. They were so average. Because they had so many faults. That's precisely the reason why Jesus chose them to do his work. Let me make my point here. As you all know, I am a big movie buff. I love movies, but in fact, I love sports movies. Some of my favorite movies are called Rudy. Have you seen that movie? Rudy, very good movie. And Remember the Titans, oh, even better movie. But to be honest with you, the greatest all-time sports movie okay, is Bad News Bears. No, that's not it. It is Hoosiers. Anyone know this movie? Can you raise your hand if you know this movie, Hoosiers? Oh, okay, Hoosiers. The movie Hoosiers is a basketball movie. It's a movie about an a old, you know, rundown coach, a basketball coach, who ends up coaching a, a small town basketball team where the whole entire, you know, high school male class was maybe about 20. It's a story about this coach who led this team to a state championship in Indiana. What made this movie and what made this character such an amazing story was not because he was such a great coach. It was not because he won a championship, but it was because of the fact that he won this championship with a bunch of ragtag, not too tall, bunch of skinny little boys. The amazing part of the story was that this coach was able to take, a, he, in his whole team, he had seven players at the end. And most of his players were, you know, average or below average height. And this coach was able to take this bunch of ragtag, nobody, bunch of, you know, you know awkward looking, you know, teenage boys. And he molded them and shaped them. And he was able to win a championship with this bunch of boys. Now, you're not really going, oh, wow. Okay, let me tell you another story, example then. What if I were to tell you that pa I asked Paraj to form a cricket team. And then, once he formed this cricket team, he would compete against my cricket team that I will form. So Paraj, raise your hand so everyone knows Paraj. <laughs> so Paraj, being a millionaire that he is, he, go, he decides to go to the, the Indian Premier League, the highest you know, level of cricket competition in the world. And he buys all these you know, world-renowned cricket players. And to be honest with you, I don't know a single one in the world in cricket. That's not my game. But he gets all these well-known cricket players from South Africa, from Australia, from England, and from Pakistan, from in India. And he gets them from all over. And then we play against, and he plays against my team. And then what if I were to tell you that I stand here today, that my team defeated Paraj's team. Score like 1,000 points to 50. I don't know the, whether that's a realistic score or not. But you get my point. I beat his team. I trounced his team. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's great. Pastor Paul must have had a really a nice team, a good team. That would be probably a good response. But you would be amazed if I were to tell you this fact. That while Paraj had his team of all these all-stars from Indian Premier League. My players were basically consist consisted of William Lee, Faith Lee, JP, Sunjin, Amy. <laughs> you know? Okay, I'll, I'll add Luke and, <laughs> and Robin and Andrew and some of you here. You know? Now, if I were to tell you that those were the people that were consistent in my team, you know what you will say? You're not going to say, wow, that was a great team. You're not going to talk about, wow, that was a great match. You're not going to say, wow, you know, good job, JP, or good job, William. What you will be saying is, wow, Pastor Paul, you must be an amazing coach. Or maybe you are such an amazing player that you were able to, you know, somehow overcome and compensate for the weaknesses of all these people. If, I were to, if that were to have really have happened, all of you guys would be, in amaze, would be amazed at me. Simply because of what I was able to accomplish with these bunch of ragtag people. 
I'm sorry, as far as cricket is concerned. See, this is why Jesus chose the 12 disciples. Because I looked at the Bible, and on many occasions, we hear God using angels, and I could have said, I said to myself, why did God choose John, James, Andrew, Philip, you know, Matthew, all these kind of, you know, no name, you know, very bland and very not well-to-do people? Why didn't he even just maybe send an army, a legion of angels to go and go throughout the world and talk about Jesus and so forth? And I realized the reason why when I studied, the reason why God didn't do that was because God wanted to be glorified. When God uses people, when people that's, you know, no one without, from, you know, obscurity comes up and does these great things like healing people, preaching with authority, you know, proclaiming God's word, doing amazing feats, accomplishing great amount of deeds. In the end, when people see that, they'll say, wow, what an amazing God for God to accomplish these things with a bunch of small group of men who are nobodies. See, God chose us. Because he wanted to be glorified. If God can use weak, imperfect sinners like us to accomplish great work of spreading the good news to the all corners of the earth, doing miracles and other great works, who gets the glory? Who did God choose to defeat the great Philistine giant in the Bible? God chose a young shepherd boy named David. Why? Because God wanted to be glorified. How many soldiers did God tell Gideon to use to defeat the army of thousands? God told him to use 300 soldiers. Why? Because he wanted to be glorified. Who did God choose to lead the Israelites out of the bondage from the mighty Egyptian empire? He chose a man with a speech impediment called Moses. Who did God choose to perform miracles and cast out demons? He chose uneducated common fishermen like John, James, and Peter and Andrew. Why? It's because God wanted to be glorified. So that through these people, people would give glory to Jesus Christ. You know, forgive me for talking about myself right now, but, you know, when people see me uh, back in America, after I became a Christian and then became a pastor, oftentimes I would run into people that I used to know in high school, that I used to know in college before I became a Christian. And it's just amazing the reaction that, that I get from them when they find out, when they hear me preach, and when they find out about me, or when they hear about me from other people. Their response is, wow, you know, it's, their response is usually, wow, Paul, you've really changed. And they can't believe it. Again, forgive me for boasting, but when I was in America, I was fortunate enough to, to be part of a wonderful church. Uh, the senior pastor of the church was well known throughout the world, and the church had a very good reputation, and I had the privilege and honor of learning and growing in that church and in that ministry. And, and, the, and the benefit that I also received was, uh, along with the church, also my name, my reputation also kind of grew. Uh, you know, right along. In fact, uh, I was not only in charge of ministry of 300 people, I was, a, I was regularly invited by other churches to do seminars and, and uh, uh, speak at revivals and, and so forth. And, and uh, also, the lo- I was a regular uh, writer columnist for a, a local Korean newspaper and so forth. So people would often call me for advices and and I would get invited to different places. And, and so I was very, forgive me, it sounds weird for coming out of my own mouth, but I was very respected and, and, and somewhat sought after in our community for my position and for my work. 
And when people discover, people from my past, when they discover, they see the name Paul Lee, but it doesn't translate and calculate. They, they just think it's someone else. They never imagine that it's me. And when they come visit our church, and when they finally see that, oh my goodness, that, that boy is the, that Paul Lee, and they're just amazed. Because the person that they knew was totally different than the person that they have heard about or they, they are watching or seeing at that moment. They see this person who preaches and maybe in their eye that it was, you know, he's, he preaches with authority and is very respected by the members of the church and he's very respected in the community. And in fact, his, you know, his name is you know, mentioned in, in the news, local newspapers. And then when they think back to the person that they used to know, this goofy little boy, all he did was play basketball. In college, he was a slacker, no discipline, always going to parties, chasing after girls unsuccessfully, and who almost flunked out of college. And when they remember that person, and then they see the person that, you know, the reputation and, and, and the person of authority, and they're just simply amazed. But here's the great part. Of course, they give me acknowledgement and praise. But ultimately, the glory goes to God. They say, oh my goodness, wow. In their mind, they say, wow. So this is what happened when you meet God. So this is what happens when God entered your life. You see, there's a reason why God chooses to use common people. People with flaws and weaknesses and past. Because God wants the glory. Some of us, we boast, thinking, you know what, man, you know, God is using me in a mighty way. You know, usually the reason why God is using you and I in a mighty way is because we're so imperfect. That's not really anything to boast about, is it? I shared this story a long time ago, but I became a Christian when I was 21, my third year in college. And my change was dramatic. After I became a Christian, my life changed upside down. And during my last year of college, I made a decision and commitment that I wanted to go to seminary. I wanted to, do, I wanted to learn more about God. I didn't think about being a pastor. I just wanted to learn more about God. So I chose to go to seminary. And it's just, it's just strange things happen when people find out that you're going to seminary. They say, wow, he must be a really mature Christian. He must know a lot about the Bible, even though I didn't. Because up until then, I had not even read the Bible through and through a single time. I was a very young Christian. I loved the Bible. I was hungry for the Bible. That was the only reason why I decided to go to seminary, a place where people go to train to be pastors and missionaries. It was not because I was so spiritual. It was not because I was a mature Christian. It was simply because I wanted to learn more about God. But when people hear that, wow, this person is going to seminary, immediately they think you're a very mature Christian. And they start giving you this position of authority. They start giving you this responsibility. And during my senior year in college, I became the Bible study leader at a, a campus ministry. Korean, it's called KCCF, Korean Christian Campus Fellowship. They start giving me that position. I became a leader. And not only that, whenever they were you know, planning things and, and they needed advice, they would come to me for all of these you know, advices. And they would look to me for leadership and guidance and authority. And to be very honest with you, I felt very good. It was a good feeling getting all this respect and you know, uh, accolade. It felt really, really nice. But I remember during this one retreat, it was a time of prayer after long evening of praise and worship. We were having a time of prayer. No, nothing, anything specific. They turned on the music. They turned on the tape player. They turned off all the lights. And the leader just simply told us, I just want you to spend next hour, at least an hour, talking to God. You cannot leave. Even if you have nothing to pray about, they say, just stay there at least an hour. Well, I began to pray. I started praying about God, you know, praying for the ministry. Please bless the Bible study. I began to pray about my mom, my, my dad, especially my dad and, and my brother who did not know God at that time. 
I began to pray about my future. I began to pray about some of my other friends who did not know God. And I began to pray and pray and pray. And about 20 or 30 minutes into their prayer, all of a sudden, just something just moved inside of my heart. And as I was praying about all these things, all of a sudden, God began to reveal in me all that I am and all that I was. God began to show me all of my imperfections and all of my faults. I was thanking God for the position that I was in. But then God began to remind me of where I came from. An undisciplined young boy who was selfish, arrogant, prideful, undisciplined in every area of his life, who almost flunked out of college, and who had weakness when it came to the opposite sex, who had weakness when it came to pride, and who had such a high ego and who easily overcame, who easily fell into temptation. And at that moment when I was praying, and when God began to show me that, I just could not stop the tears from flowing out of my eyes. And for the next 20, 30 minutes, the only thing that I could do, I couldn't even say a word. I just kept crying and crying and crying. And people would come to me and they saw me cry and they kept praying for me thinking maybe I had some problems and there were some, you know, problems in my life and they wanted to comfort me and they were praying, but I just couldn't even look at them in the eye because I was so ashamed of who I was. I was so ashamed of my pride and my arrogance and my ego to think that because people gave me accolades and praise and respect that, that I, I've earned it. For the next 20, 30 minutes, I cried and I wept. And in my heart, only thing that I could say to God was simply, thank you, God, for using someone like me. Thank you, God, for choosing someone like me. That is why Jesus chose this bunch of ragtag group of 12. Peter, he was a coward. He was such a coward that he denied Jesus three times to women. Jesus chose Matthew. Matthew was a reject in their community. He was considered a traitor, he was considered an outcast, and nobody liked him. That's why throughout the Bible, you see Jesus choosing Mary, a prostitute. That's why throughout the Bible, Jesus purposely used people who were foreigners, considered second class. He would use little boys. Why? Because Jesus wanted to be glorified through their lives so that everyone in this world will accept Jesus as their Lord and as their, and as their Savior. The strange thing, when Jesus invited these fishermen, follow me, the Bible tells us that these men accepted Jesus' offer without hesitation. They immediately dropped their net and they followed Jesus. Why? I believe it's because these men knew the great things that Jesus could do in their lives if they simply followed him. And when they heard the offer from Jesus, that from that moment on, that they will no longer be fishermen's but they will be fishers of men. They were probably honored by Jesus' selection, and they simply obeyed. 
And throughout the history, through the obedience, sacrifice, and service of people like them, the name of God has been glorified. And God is still making that offer today. Again, not because we're so smart or educated or capable, because God wants to use us, use our lives to glorify God. And some of us may feel like, you know, I am not adequate. I don't have time. I'm not a good speaker. I'm very shy. I'm not well educated. I want you to know that is exactly the reason why God chose you. Because He can use you. He can use you to glorify God. Let us pray.